And welcome to the second joint digital talk with the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. And we hope this will be the second of many more joint sessions to come. In a moment, I'll be handing over to Dr. Kevin Butterfield, director of the Washington Library, uh, who's a noted American historian and specialist in the founding era, who will give a more detailed introduction of George Goodwin. But let me just mention that George is the Benjamin Franklin House author in residence. Um, so we are very pleased and proud to have him uh, in that special capacity. They will be talking about Washington Franklin and the British, very appropriate topic, uh, drawing on the research that George completed during his fellowship at the Washington Library. Let me just mention some upcoming events that we have at Benjamin Franklin House, including this Wednesday, the 11th of November at 5 p.m. London, 12 p.m. Eastern, when we welcome the celebrated British American author, Amanda Foreman, who will be joining us for Ben's book club. It's a digital book club where she will talk about her book, A World on Fire, which tells the story of the role that the British played in the American Civil War. And then on Tuesday, the 24th of November at 6 p.m. London, 1 p.m. Eastern, please join us for an American themed quiz for Thanksgiving with exclusive Benjamin Franklin House treats to be won. And all proceeds go to furthering our mission of bringing history and innovation to life. And uh, finally, on uh, Wednesday, the, the um, I think the 9th of December at 5 p.m. London, 12 p.m. Eastern, George will be joining us to discuss his book, Christmas Traditions, which is an entertaining and enlightening guide to the sacred and secular traditions of Christmas. So without further ado, let me turn over the virtual floor to Dr. Kevin Butterfield. And thank you so much to all my colleagues for this wonderful joint collaboration. Thank you, Marcia. This is going to be exciting. And thanks so much for joining us and helping us to do this. We'll do more. Fantastic. Well, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, further introduce our guests for the hour, uh, but also uh, to welcome you on behalf of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, the Washington Library, of which I, I get to serve as director. And I'm delighted to, to welcome you to this live stream event, a partnered event uh, with the Benjamin Franklin House in London. Uh, we're so pleased you're a part of our ever expanding, ever international audience. Uh, before we dive into today's lecture, I want I too want to mention a couple of upcoming events. Uh, I'll just uh, pick a couple that are right around the corner and very exciting. Uh, we have our uh, monthly Ford Evening Book Talk uh, coming up this month in November on November 18th, a Wednesday night, uh, where Peter Enriquez, a noted, noted Washington scholar, will be talking about his new work, uh, First and Always, A New Portrait of George Washington. Uh, our next installments of, of a joint live stream program is going to be with Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, uh, which will take place on Thursday, November 19th. Uh, this installment will actually feature some younger scholars, some uh, we're calling this New Frontiers in Early American History, featuring four rising star historians who have completed fellowships at one or both institutions. Uh, and you can learn more about and, and register for these programs. Uh, at Mount Vernon uh, slash library, um, and we're very excited to to have uh, a, a still thriving roster of events uh, happening uh, online uh, and free. Our, tea, our speaker for today is George Goodwin. Let me tell you a little bit about him before we bring him on screen. Uh, George uh, was the Washington Library's 2018 and 2019 uh, Dr. William M. and Betty H. Busey Family Fellow. Uh, he was also an international fellow at the Robert H. Smith Center for Jefferson Studies uh, at Monticello uh, a couple of times. Uh, and his research project most recently at, at Mount Vernon is something we'll dive into today. Uh, his look at Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, uh, the propaganda and intelligence and, and persuasion wars uh, surrounding uh, the American Revolutionary Era. Uh, it's the basis of a forthcoming book that we'll hear more about. Uh, he's a graduate of Cambridge University, the author in residence at Ben Franklin House, as you just learned, an Eccle Center a fellow at the British Library, a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, which I just discovered, uh, and is also the author of another forthcoming book uh, with another Washington Library fellow, uh, Chef Justin Cherry, which will actually take us in an entirely different direction from where we'll discuss today, although who knows, we could touch on it during Q&A, uh, George Washington's Life with Food which George is co-authoring, and we hope to have that out sometime soon. Uh, welcome, George. I'm excited to talk with you about Ben Franklin, George Washington, and so many interesting aspects of the revolutionary years. 
Well, thank you very much indeed, Kevin. It's uh, always a delight to see you. I've got a little bit of glasses glare, but I can tell you I still can see you. And I'm very much look, looking forward to this talk. Well, that's great. So thank you uh, for, for joining us from, from overseas. Uh, so I'm coming from Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., in my home. Can you tell everyone where you're coming from? I am coming from uh, very close to Kew Gardens, the uh, Kew Gardens Botanical Garden uh, in Kew, which is sort of Richmond, the other, the, the I would like to say the first Richmond, actually it was the second Richmond, there's a Richmond in Yorkshire. Uh, it's the second uh, Richmond, of course, the third Richmond being in, in Virginia. Well, uh, welcome, and what a world we live in that we can have this conversation across the ocean. Um, exactly. Well, let's uh, let's get started. Uh, you, I, I think there's a good opportunity for us to sort of um, lay the foundation for our conversation today by talking a, a bit about some work that you've completed years ago, uh, and which you have a, a, a wonderful book on on the larger story of Ben Franklin's formation and, and his formative years. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got started, uh, why Ben Franklin mattered to you, uh, what you, um, what first led you down this path of wanting to explore this man? Well, I'd always been very interested in, in Benjamin Franklin, and um, I discovered, I discovered that there had never ever been a book on Benjamin Franklin in London. So uh, I thought, well, this is a bit of an opportunity. And uh, with the help of, of Benjamin Franklin House and the, the late great uh, Lady Reed, who was their um, their um, author, was the uh, was sorry was their uh, house historian. Um, you know, I did a phenomenal amount of research, and uh, the um, the Benjamin Franklin Library uh, at Yale uh, under Ellen Cohn, they were incredibly helpful as well, and. Uh, I have to say, it's a book that uh, I very much enjoyed doing. So if, if you were to uh, start introducing us to Benjamin Franklin's formative years, I think it actually starts back on this side of the Atlantic, right? Uh, that he's first shaped by the British world that, that you uh, later place him in physically. He's uh, shaped by what's going on in London, the thoughts that are swirling around there long before he travels across the Atlantic, right? Well, absolutely. Well, he was, uh, I mean, beforehand, uh, he was uh, able to gain great access to, to books uh, when he first became a printer uh, with his brother James in Boston. And uh, this sort of prepared him for when he came to, to London in 1824 uh, as a young teenage printer. And if we go to the, the next slide, I can show you the great sort of influences on him. Now, uh, on the, um, and they really were major influences. On the, the left, we've got John Locke, and of him, Franklin said that his essay concerning human understanding was the best book of logic ever written. And next in line, we have Joseph Addison of The Spectator, who was a great influence on colonial Americans. In fact, right into the war, um, his uh, play Cato uh, was being quoted by, I mean, Washington quoted uh, Addison's Cato. Even John Adams went into massive martial mood and started quoting Cato, which is the play, uh, basically Cato's um, assault on, uh, on Julius Caesar. And, uh, but as far as Franklin was concerned, I mean, Addison uh, had done more to, and he wrote this, had done more to, um, to contribute to the improvement of the minds of the British nation and in polishing their manners than any other English pen whatsoever. And then next along, we have Daniel Defoe. And from him, I mean, we know Daniel Defoe as the author of Robinson Crusoe, Moel Flanner's this year's runaway bestseller of Defoe's, which I'm very sorry to say, uh, a journal of the plague year, but he also wrote some instructive books, a, a complete tradesman and a journey through the whole island of Great Britain. And I'll come back to that in a moment. But on the, the right, we have Benjamin Franklin's greatest hero, Isaac Newton, who this young printer was absolutely desperate to meet when he was in London. And he was promised that he would meet uh, Newton, but uh, the chap who gave the promise, who knew Newton, actually didn't, uh, didn't bring it about. But however, Franklin did meet 
uh, Newton's number two, Sir Hans Sloane. Uh, and uh, that's the reason for this rather funny looking thing at the bottom. Uh, it's a, um, it looks like a dead animal, but actually it's an asbestos purse. And um, we've got lots of uh, various uh, bits of information on this. We've got the, the letter that, uh, that, I'm not quite sure what's happening here. We've got, no, the letter. <laughs> We've got the letter that um, uh, that Franklin sent to um, to add uh, to, uh, to, to Sir Hans Sloane, and actually it's very very funny because um, he was a Franklin was a bit of a huckster. I mean, he said to Sloane, "I'm only going to be in uh, in London for uh, a couple of days, even though he'd been here for six months, and he was going to mm. be here for another year." Uh, as, but he managed to sell, sell this to him, and it was in the founding collection of the British Museum, which Sir Hans Sloane created. Now, the key thing is, and if we could have the next slide, Jim, is when, uh, when he went back to America, um, Franklin turned himself into a great man of business, but rather more than that, uh, he introduced all these elements that he gained from these, these great thinkers. I mean, from Addison and Locke, he set up the Junto, which was uh, a sort of coffee house society based on the coffee house society that he'd enjoyed in London, which led to the, the Library Company of Philadelphia. That was the first lending library in America. Uh, from Locke, he also took the un idea for a university, and that became the University of Pennsylvania. And from Locke and Newton, the American Philosophical Society, which ba was based on the Royal Society. And from the very practical Defoe, he took an idea for setting up a fire service, fire insur insurance, and America's first public hospital. Which you is know, something, it jumped out to me on that screen, uh, George, that the middle two men in particular, Addison and uh, um, the the other one, uh, Daniel Defoe, uh, yeah. both of them are, are remarkable in, in how they articulated the value of coming together, of forming societies and clubs. And uh, both of them uh, are very articulate about that. Locke and Newton, in their own way, are, are a part of those worlds. Yeah. But Addison and Defoe, are, are, they, they express that the, what what happens when you bring people together and you you begin to socialize and interact and, and it, the, the possibilities that it opens up. It must have been so exciting for Ben Franklin, and then he was able to bring it into a world that just embraced it uh, because of uh, because of uh, the power of that idea. Absolutely. I mean, it um, as uh, you know, as he said, he sort of threw himself into coffee house society, and he met all kinds of people. Uh, he he met this uh, character uh, Bernard Mandeville, who was uh, author of the Fable of the Bees, which was a very sort of risky uh, book at the time. Uh, it was um, basically saying that uh, you know humans are are, um, are basically animals out for their own good. It was kind of like a sort of uh, not quite such a nasty version of Thomas Hobbes, if you like. Uh, but it also had elements where it sort of uh, denied the existence of God. Uh, and uh, Franklin never went that far, but he certainly was, did write some, some deus tracts when he was in London. In fact, he got fired by one of his printers for writing a deus tract. And in fact, he tried to, Franklin tried to destroy all the copies later on because, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the fact that we know that he did this and we, we know what the track was shows that he didn't actually succeed. It's such a, such a fascinating period. The 18th century writ large, uh, there's, there's a new optimism, right? There's, there's this uh, idea that humans can make the world something different than what they were born into uh, and they can come together and have these possibilities are there. And that's always struck me as such an important part of the revolutionary ethos here in the United States. Uh, that that is the the possibilities are, are are there for us to make a new world, to build a new republic, to build a oh, new world for the ages. Completely and utterly, and and this really uh, led into Franklin's science. I mean, here I'm showing him on the on the left. This is the first known portrait of Franklin uh, by Robert Feek of Rhode Island, who was a great portrait painter of the time. And here, of course, he wanted to show himself not as a printer. I mean, those, those cuffs really would be in trouble uh, in the printing press. Um, he wanted to show himself as a successful man of business, which he 
he actually was. And of course, uh, he was able to retire quite early, the age of 42. And then he dedicated himself to politics and to science. And as far as the science was concerned, this was typical of the time. You, uh, you did your experiments and you found your conclusions. And then if somebody else wanted to take it on, that was brilliant. So for instance, with the, the Franklin stove, uh, Franklin actually got rather annoyed that uh, somebody else came in and got his stove to work rather better. And he took a patent out on it. And Franklin thought, no, you don't do that. That is not what science is about. Science is about a series of progressions where we are all joined together for the common good. Fascinating. Well, th this takes us into, uh, you said he's retired at age 42, but clearly he has a long life ahead of him. Uh, tell, tell us about the, the, the next stage of life. So he comes back to the United States, introduces these great things, the library company, the uh, one of the first fire societies uh, uh, in, in Philadelphia, all of these, um, and the, the Gento, of course, all of these things that help to, um, I don't know, uh, create new possibilities in, in Philadelphia and other places. Um, but uh, soon, eventually, he'll be returning to London. Uh, tell us a bit about this transition uh, and where he, there's a couple of stages in his life when where London is the, is is his home. Um, are we are we ready to move forward to that stage? I think we're ready to move forward because, as far as the politics are concerned, he had been the person who wrote down the debates of the Assembly of Pennsylvania and printed them. But after he retired, he became uh, not only a member of the Assembly, he became one of the leading members, and uh, the science. Um, tied in as well, because um, by the time in um, 1757 that uh, the assembly wanted to send him over to London to get uh, Thomas Penn, the proprietor of Pennsylvania, and people asked me what proprietor means, and in this case it meant basically he owned Pennsylvania, and uh, everybody else who took um, land from him they did it on a kind of a lease, leasehold basis. Um, anyway, by that time, uh, with his electrical experiments, um, had made him so so famous. I mean, he he did far more than uh, take his uh, uh, take his kite out and uh, and and um, do the electrical experiment. Actually, by that stage, uh, he had already proved various things, such as. Uh, the one fluid theory of electricity, which meant that you had positive and negative. He created those ideas. He also created the idea of the, the battery. He was the first person to do that. And all these came together in a book, which was promoted by a great friend of his in Britain, uh, Thomas uh, Collinson, who um, publicized him and as a result of his experiments and observations made in Philadelphia, the title of the book, he won the Copley Medal, which was the equivalent of winning the Nobel Prize at the time. And he was, he was famed across Europe. I mean, he uh, was called, Immanuel Kant called him the Prometheus of the modern age. So, I mean, that's pretty good. Anyway, he came over to London to try and get the proprietor of Pennsylvania to actually to pay some money to the assembly because it had been done on the basis of grants and they wanted him to be, uh, to be taxed. And he came over as this, this famous scientist and this allowed him to uh, become very closely involved, not only as a representative of the assembly of Pennsylvania, but actually as a major colonial figure uh, in London. And if we go to the next slide, Jim. So um, here at the bottom, I've actually got uh, some pictures from Benjamin Franklin House, where he came in 1757. And he stayed there with a, except for a short trip back to um, Philadelphia between 1762 and four. He stayed there right up to March 1775. And the reason why he stayed so long was he was desperately trying to gain an accommodation between the British government and the American colonies. And he and uh, William Pitt, Earl of Chatham, who's off on the left here, uh, 
they became uh, very close and uh, came up with a, a plan for um, assembling a kind of peace between the colonies and Britain. And uh, so actually on the 1st of February, 1775, uh, Chatham put this plan to the House of Lords, but effectively it was shouted down by the hard man of Lord North's government over on the right, uh, the Earl of Sandwich. And uh, that was really the, the end of the plan. Uh, Franklin, who had enjoyed such a wonderful time in London, not only as this, uh, this representative, but as this great scientist. And uh, here he is in this David Martin portrait in the middle of 1766 uh, to 7. And guess who that uh, bust is on his desk? It's Sir Isaac Newton. Mm. Anyway, so he then uh, he took ship just before he was arrested. And while he was at sea, Lexington and Concord broke out. Wow. So t t I know that there's a, at least a popular image of what uh, Franklin, excuse me, as the the great socialite, someone who's just so uh, in, enjoyable to have a drink with uh, that he could dazzle any audience. Could you talk to us a little bit about Franklin? Uh, was he able to, to essentially dazzle the, 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 the people that we're talking about now? The, that is the elites in Great Britain? Well, he had uh, he had access. I mean, uh, the late great Bernard Balin said that he didn't really have much of a political clout in Britain, and I actually rather disagree with that. Uh, mm. Because what Franklin did was he worked through the under secretaries of the great politicians, uh, and that worked. And he became very close to the Earl of Shelburne, who was Secretary of State under the short-lived uh, Chatham administration. And, uh, you know, he was dining with, um, he was dining with uh, Shelburne the whole time. Now, in terms of, uh, of getting on with people, certainly if Franklin wanted to get on with you, he would get on brilliantly. But Joseph Priestley, who was probably closer to Franklin than anybody else by the time that Franklin uh, left London in 1775. Uh, he said this of Franklin. He said uh, he said um, to uh, to strangers he was cold. Only if he knew you, uh, he would then become friendly. And in fact, somebody else said, you know, if somebody that he didn't know and uh, didn't have a good introduction to came into one of his clubs. Franklin wouldn't say anything for half an hour until he worked out whether this person was going to be a friend or foe. Hmm. But certainly, if he wanted to become, you know, a jolly life and soul of the party, singing songs, etc., yes, he certainly could do that. This is a good opportunity for me to remind everyone out there uh, to be thinking of questions and, in fact, go, going ahead and entering questions uh, into the chat function that you see in front of you. Uh, so that we can come to those soon. Uh, we're going to continue our conversation for a bit, but we're going to have plenty of time for audience questions. Uh, so uh, please uh, get your questions uh, in the queue, and we'll 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 speak to them soon. Uh, George, uh, keep telling us about what happens here. Uh, uh, I think we want to bring George Washington into the story at some point. I How think about we now? do. I okay. think we certainly do. And I think if we move to the next slide, I hope that we will do. And here he is. Uh, I mean, Frank, and in the middle. Is, um, is still in the Smithsonian. It's the cane which was given by the French government to Benjamin Franklin uh, at the end of his, uh, his time as the first American ambassador uh, in France. And uh, I mean, he really was a, a major figure. Actually, there's a great quote from Thomas Jefferson. Somebody said to, to Jefferson, uh, are you going to succeed Benjamin Franklin? And he said, no one can, can succeed Dr. Franklin. I can merely follow Dr. Franklin as ambassador. Hmm. And, um, and during the war, of course, uh, Franklin was in France. He uh, brought them, helped to bring them into the war. Of course, Saratoga helped as well. Uh, and he kept them there. And he was able to... Uh, you know, in, when America was in absolute uh, dire straits, he was able to, to, uh, to bring in loan after loan from the French government that kept the show on the road. 
And uh, part of the um, part of the time that uh, he was in France, uh, he used Washington as a symbol of the revolution. And uh, I mean, he wrote to, actually, it's rather sweet. I mean, he wrote letters to Washington saying, you know, encouraging him, saying, you know, the, all the generals here are getting their maps out and they're studying your campaigns and they're thinking you're doing the most tremendous job. And uh, so that, uh, that was actually quite a sort of a major part of uh, the way that um, Washington, if you like, was, uh, was used as a, a pra propaganda um, element uh, in France. And I think if we see the next slide, Oh, sorry, yeah, there's a slide after this. Um, in fact, can we see the next slide? And then we can come back to this one. Yeah, on the left here, uh, we actually have a, um, a version of the Charles Wilson Peel portrait uh, of 1776. And uh, what is, uh, it's obviously, as you can see at the bottom, uh, it represents um, uh, General Washington uh, in French, but a very important thing right at the bottom it has, you know, thanks to uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, because uh, it's sort of based on the portrait that he brought over in uh, 1779. And in fact, I mean, Franklin and Lafayette worked together using the image of George Washington to promote the American cause. And Lafayette, I mean, fantastic during the war, but I think this was, uh, you know, fantastic on a military uh, level, but I think this was actually even more important because he got the young aristocrat aristocracy of France behind the American effort, and the the French government just had to give way. They had to commit re more resources to the war effort, and it was very very important. Now, now, if, you ask yeah, you lot, if, you, if you can just reflect on that, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, what, we, in hindsight, it seems obvious that you seize upon Washington as the symbol of the cause, as as the as the the way to um, rally support, to essentially uh, uh, have a, a PR effort on behalf of the revolutionary cause. Uh, was it obvious to to Franklin and Lafayette from the start that that was going to be the symbol that they should embrace, or, or do they ever articulate why they chose him over something else, uh, perhaps some icon or or the flag or you know whatever? I'm just curious why. Well, uh, well of course, by then, I mean Washington uh, was a success. I mean he'd uh, he'd really established himself as the uh, as the leader of the revolution. I mean, I think that uh, the most, his most important battle basically was the Battle of Monmouth in June 1778 because, okay, tactically, it was a draw. I mean, uh, the, the British troops were able to, uh, they were able to withdraw. They were able to get away from Philadelphia and get to New York. But it was a victory for, for Washington he was able to effectively, well, and this is really part of the propaganda, he was able to, uh, to defeat his enemies within the army, such as Charles Lee, and without in Congress. And of course, uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Lawrence did the most tremendous propaganda job of letter writing, submitting articles to newspapers, and uh, that really established him as a primus inter pares completely. So why, what I'm very interested in discussing with you, Kevin, is, uh, and if we go back to that, uh, that previous slide, is uh, why Washington was uh, the natural military fit. And uh, I'm... Very grateful to Sam Snyder and Adam Irby at, uh, at Mount Vernon, who uh, I, mean, I asked them, I said, you know, is this the only, the portrait on the left of his brother Lawrence, uh, is this the only portrait that uh, George Washington had in his inner sanctum uh, at Mount Vernon in his study? And they said, well, look at the inventory. And I looked at the inventory and it was. And we don't know, we don't know for sure whether it was in the 
absolute pride of place that it is in the study at Mount Vernon now. But I think we probably can assume that it was because Lawrence had such a major effect on his half brother. I mean, after all, um, he, um, I mean, young George was 14 years, um, 14 years younger. Uh, Lawrence became a, a, a father figure after uh, their father died when George was only 11. Uh, he went to, to Mount Vernon often. And this actually, Lawrence was the figure who had been uh, in the British Army, well, actually in the Navy as a Marine, but, you know, sort of the Army in the Navy, if you like. And uh, he had been so impressed with his commander, Admiral Vernon, that, of course, he, when he inherited uh, Little Hunting Creek, uh, he changed its name to Mount Vernon. So, I mean, that's, of course, where, where Mount Vernon comes, from this sort of British heritage. And, of course, Lawrence died, uh, and in, I think, 1752, if I remember, or 1754. And uh, George slipped into his shoes. I mean, Lawrence had married extremely well into the Fairfax family, and they had taken George under their wing and given him his first job as a surveyor. But he also slipped into Lawrence's shoes as adjutant of the Virginia Regiment. And uh, it's fascinating. If you look at this, uh, the portrait, the Charles Wilson Peel portrait from 1772 on the right. Now, uh, there many years after uh, George had left the Virginia Regiment, in disgust that the British uh, military authorities hadn't given him a commission in the regular British Army. Yet he was proud of this, proud of this, uh, so that he always insisted on being called Colonel Washington. And this portrait was in the front parlor in Pride of Place. So if you want to know how George Washington identified himself, it was as a military man. Well, let's go on to this discussion of the use of George Washington. And I, I, at the side that we were just looking at, we saw an image on the left uh, that you said Lafayette uh, it can be uh, given some credit for its creation. What do we see on the right? Well, on the right uh, are um, some letters purportedly from George Washington uh, written in 1776, which were published in 1777 in the British press. Now, uh, these weren't letters from, from George Washington. They were fakes, and they were fakes that were put there by British intelligence at the time, because George Washington, as I think I said before, had been regarded as this, uh, this great military figure. Uh, he, in the British, uh, by the British as well, uh, because he was seen as a, as a proper, English gentleman, but a gentleman, you know, not a full-time military person, which actually turns the, um, the anti-war newspapers in Britain, uh, they use this against their own generals and saying, well, you know, how come this plantation owner, part-time soldier, is actually to keep on thrashing our generals and they keep on having to be recalled? So it was thought by necessary by the as I said, by British intelligence to uh, to release these letters, these fakes. They didn't work. I mean, the, the Monthly Review, which was one of the major opposition uh, journals of the time, it was, uh, publisher was Ralph Griffiths, who actually uh, Franklin used as a letterbox for, um, for his own, uh, for uh, Patriot's own agents. Uh, in Britain during the war. Anyway, Ralph Griffith said, uh, uh, wrote that uh, it was beautifully written, but I mean, they obviously weren't genuine. But wow. these would actually have a bit of a resonance, wouldn't they, a bit later. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I know a bit of this story that in, in the 1790s, at, at a certain turning point where Washington's reputation is no longer 100% uh, safe from assault uh, from the other side in, in American politics. Is that when these are, are republished? Absolutely. Is that right, George? Well, absolutely. They were published by Benjamin Franklin's grandson, Benjamin Franklin Beige, who, uh, unlike his, uh, his father, was actually very anti-George Washington. And they were actually published like this, you know, as if these were, you know, the real thing. 
And unsurprisingly, Washington went absolutely mad. I mean, he was furious. And in fact, there's a report by, obviously, Sally Byers, by Thomas Jefferson about, uh, about Franklin, as about what Washington really going berserk at a, at a cabinet meeting about uh, the public, this publication, also publications by Freno, uh, which were undermining his, his, his sort of his position as not only the president, but actually the symbol of the new uh, United States. Remarkable. So this, this has all the feel, uh, this, this feels familiar uh, in a 21st century sense. We, we feel like <laughs> comfortable with the idea that another country might spread misinformation. And this is uh, a really remarkable early instance of this. Yeah, it's fake news. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let's let's go on talking about the use of, the, of, of, of these these images, the ways in which the, the, the information wars are being waged during the Revolutionary War years. What else uh, can you tell us, George? Well, caricature was actually quite a major, a major feature, uh, and um, both in in Britain and in France. In fact, the French would uh, take um, British caricatures and they would uh, they would reuse them. And, and uh, if we go to the next slide, here is a a French, well, actually a British caricature. Uh, you can tell at the top it has Philadelphia. The French actually couldn't be bothered to uh, to change to scroll out the A at the end and call it Philadelphia. But here we have, um, and the one reason why I'm I'm, I'm using it's not just to show you know that uh, this was a representation of America. They often showed uh, America as a sort of uh, semi Native American figure with with feathers uh, soaring off um, the horns of the cow, representing. British trade. The uh, the merchant is uh, is really at his uh, really upset, as you can see. He's sort of uh, ripping his clothes, and then the Dutch are milking the the cow of trade, and the French directing the Dutch and also the Spanish. And actually, on the left, we've got the lion looking very very upset. And as often happened in these caricatures, you have a um, a dog, a little dog, making its mark. And he's making his mark <laughs> on the man's head. And actually, in the original British version, it was a, a little stream. And here it seems to be a bit of a flood. But the important thing here is they are quoting Le Bonhomme Richard, um, which was the French name for, for Paul Richard, which was, of course, going back in, from the 1930s to the 19, sorry, the 1730s to the 1750s, uh, Benjamin Franklin's. Um, Almanac character, where all the the famous Benjamin Franklin sayings come from, and in fact, you know, Paul Richard was used by the French. In fact, it was John Jones, um, it was James's um, John Paul Jones's um, flagship in the Battle of Flamborough Head against the uh, against the British, and uh, you know, so just as um, Franklin used Washington. To promote the war, the French actually also use Franklin. Interesting. Yeah, this is great. And I, I don't know how you you decipher these 18th century cartoons. They always drive me crazy with the layers upon layers of, of images and and representational figures. But uh, I'm glad you were able to break this one down for us. Well, the next one is really straightforward. If you yeah, here we are. This is James Gilray, uh, the great James Gilray, one of the early Gilrays. And this uh, is a rep representation of America. This time is a rattlesnake. Often they used the, the rattlesnake image. And here we have, uh, this was in 1782. And this was very much for, oh, for goodness sake, let's end the war. Because uh, in the British press, this was used in the British press and in the print shops. And because here we have the rattlesnake has captured on the far right, uh, that's your, that is Saratoga. Uh, British troops uh, and officers are um, captured there. In the middle is uh, that's Yorktown, and uh, in that coil there is a, a little notice which says "apartment to rent for British officers." So basically, saying, "Can we please end the war now? Because that's what's going to happen next." Wow! Can, uh, this image—I I haven't seen this one before. I, I'm curious. It, it, the the American landscape looks quite desolate. Is that is that deliberate? 
Uh, I'm Just, not sure whether it, it well. It feels like I'm I, in a desert when I look at this I image. Does, it does look like a desert, doesn't it? Um, quite frankly, um, quite a lot of um, British images of America, uh, as were French images, were, weren't based on knowledge. They were based a bit on ignorance, like um, in the... Um, the, uh, the cartoon caricature of, of Washington, there's a uh, Billy Lee in the backwards and he's wearing kind of Arab gear, uh, Washington's uh, enslaved servant. So uh, I, yes, I don't think we can, we can pick up anything from, from that, but it mm -hmm. may be actually coming to think about it, Kevin, that uh, the desert image may have been used to say, look, you know, getting across, you know, there's 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 no um, there's no fertility in this current uh, conflict. Let's just let's end it now. That's great. Uh, well, so we're coming close to audience question time, George. Uh, uh, tell, tell us a little bit about how you you plan to bring all this together. I know you've got a, you're working on a book on the subject matter uh, and uh, the relationship between Washington and Franklin and the and the, the information and propaganda wars of the revolution. Uh, bring, bring things together for us, and then we'll go to some audience questions. Okay. Well, first of all, of course, I will, uh, I will show this one. I can't resist it because uh, people will see at the, uh, at, uh, at the bottom, it has the word Washington on it, which is actually rather confusing. Um, it, it shows the sort of the um, – it was made by Staffordshire Potters, and um, the – I'm not sure whether it was the Potters really um, didn't realize that, in fact, this was Benjamin Franklin or whether some of their audiences didn't realize it was Benjamin Franklin. But, I mean, they carried on. This is part of massive trade between Great Britain and uh, the new United States. In fact, at the end of Washington's presidency, trade between the two had doubled from what it had been before the war. But to go back to your, your question, Kevin, what I am going, going to concentrate on, what I call the, the information, George Washington and the Information War of Independence, co-starring, of course, Benjamin Franklin, is I am going to deal with the, uh, the way that uh, key events were, um, were portrayed uh, in the press on both sides of the, of the Atlantic on how intelligence was used and how presentation was all important and in a sense i've dealt with the way that uh, washington was being presented in uh, in the propaganda but i'm also very very interested in the way that washington him presented himself uh, as this figure why he was the the natural leader of the army in the beginning I mean, let's face it, it was him or John Hancock. And I think had it been John Hancock, it would have been a complete disaster. But Washington basically appeared in his military uniform and they thought, oh, this is the man. Well, let's go to some questions, George. Uh, thank you so much for, for uh, exploring this topic with us. We've got a, a, some questions coming in. Um, I, we can, uh, I think, dive a bit more into some of the details. Uh, so I, our first question has kind of come to us from Cynthia Miller. Uh, she's interested in Franklin's ultimate goals early on. Uh, how much of it all did Franklin try to persuade the colonists and Washington to reconcile with the British rather than declare independence and go to war? Can you talk to us about Franklin's move from um, a, a more reconciliatory pose to a, a, a more uh, revolutionary one? Well, um, I think I, I feel I probably pushed the reconciliation almost further than anybody else uh, in, in this book. I mean, I come to the conclusion that um, it wasn't until uh, Franklin sat down on board ship and wrote a 20,000 word um, letter to his son, William, explaining what it had been going on, how he had met with various people, uh, his friend, Dr. John Fothergill and, and uh, Mr. Barclay of Barclay's Bank to, to as liaison people with, uh, with Lord North, um, how he'd sort of really tried his hardest. But uh, in writing that 20,000 word letter, I think it was then that he, he 
switched. I mean, he, he had this, um, this uh, sort of approach of, um, of, of writing pros and cons for things. Uh, it was his sort of uh, mathematical logic, if you like. And uh, so he put, you know, and after a few days, he'd go back again and he might push one thing from one column to the next. Hmm. But I, I think it was on that trip that he decided, right, uh, independence is the answer. And uh, he was actually one of the fiercest patriots after that moment. And uh, interestingly, he expected, you know, he was really surprised that his son, William, who was the royal governor of, of uh, New Jersey, didn't actually agree with it. Remark, yeah, that's always been one of those, those great uh, family uh, divergences that, that it's, it's difficult for us who, who study the period to, to quite understand or appreciate what it would have felt like to be either of those two men. Uh, let's go to another question. Uh, Susan is curious about uh, Washington uh, and London. Uh, I don't believe Washington ever visited London. Uh, you could talk to us a little bit about Washington's uh, um, travels and, and possible travels to, to England. Uh, why not? And uh, did folks like Lord Fairfax or Washington himself not think it a good idea to go overseas? Uh, what, what do you know about Washington's possible travels and his uh, uh, decisions not to go uh, to, to the old world? Well, I mean, Washington, um, the furthest he ever went was to Barbados. And, uh, and of course, he, he, um, he wrote a diary about it, which uh, I think is, uh, is it that in the possession of Mount Vernon now, the diary? Or is the Library well, of Congress? We just, pu we just published it. Um, uh, so it's just newly yeah. available and, and as, a, as a publication. Um, uh, so, yes, the Barbados diary is gripping. Uh, yeah. and, more or less. He's a young man. He, he's yeah. not, uh, not a great diarist uh, quite yet, but it's interesting uh, in his, his, his uh, story but, of his travels. But in terms of, in terms of going to, to London, uh, he didn't feel that um, he needed to go to London. Um, um, he was actually far too busy looking after his plantation. Uh, he communicated with London a lot particularly with, um, with merchants, he was always keen to know whether something was fashionable. And he took it very much amiss when uh, he felt that he was getting second, second quality, unfashionable things from the, from the British merchants. And he also took it very much amiss when uh, he was being hammered by a lowering in prices for tobacco and grain, and they were pushing him for money. And I think this is one of the reasons why he thought, well, this isn't actually fair. You know, we are not being treated as equals. It was the same as the, as the military thing. Yeah. And that, I mean, as David Stewart said in a recent talk with him, I mean, that sort of drove him to, uh, to become more sort of pro- um, standing up to Britain even before Franklin with the with the Fairfax res, res, uh, resolves. There, and there's a wonderful letter that, that Mount Vernon now has possession of uh, from uh, George Washington writing to the acting governor of Virginia, Robert Dinwiddie. There's a line in it that stuck in my in my mind uh, ever since I first read it. Um, he's writing about this frustration and not getting a commission and his officers not being treated fairly uh, by the, 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 the royal administration. Uh, in the midst of the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War. And he has this line where he says, we can't conceive that being Americans should deprive us of the benefits of British subjects. Uh, and so quite early on, in, in the mid-1750s, he's already thinking about that frustration and that challenge. Uh, and of course, it's something that, that bears fruit 20 years later. That's fantastic. I mean, that was almost at the, exactly the same time when uh, in 1754, when uh, Franklin was at the, uh, the Albany Congress and he was coming up with this plan for a sort of kind of defensive union of the colonies getting together and uh, under a uh, rather, rather ironically under a British figure named a president general. And uh, at the time he wrote a letter saying that he regarded the colonies as like counties of England. Hmm. There, and just just to, to bring things full circle, there, 
a famous cartoon from that that effort by, by Franklin is again the, the rattlesnake embodying America. And I think many people will have seen it, the rattlesnake cut into sections representing the different colonies. Um, exactly. Let's go to another question. Uh, Tammy, uh, Tammy is interested ab about these groups, these clubs, these societies that we talked about. Um, uh, Franklin participated in, introduced many societies and organizations. That we know, uh, but can you talk to us about what he did afterwards? Was he involved in the day-to-day? -day? Did, did he help to administer and, and lead these organizations? Oh, yes. I mean, absolutely, because he'd, he'd been quite a key figure in, um, in London. I mean, there was a club from the Royal Society, which he was a, uh, the dining club, and there was also a, um, a dining club, uh, the Club of Honest Wigs, uh, where he met with with important people uh, like Richard Price, Joseph Priestley, uh, James Boswell actually dropped in once and uh, you know and described the the club. Uh, he said that um, they were um, physicians. They weren't actually physicians. A lot of them were were clergymen. And uh, but when he went back to to America after the 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 first time, yes, of course. Uh, uh, he was a leading figure in the in the Janta and in setting up the library company. Uh, that actually started off with him uh, him borrowing books and uh, setting up the idea of oh well I'm borrowing books from why don't why don't we all put them in in a common place? And and certainly yeah and he was um, he was very clubbable if you were on his wavelength. Put it that way. That's right. Uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm so glad to, to have uh, this conversation with you, George, because it's something I studied long before I came to Mount Vernon and still care about. Just this idea of coming together to accomplish something or to just rub, rub off the, the rough edges of one another and, and become better and more polished people. It actually is. It's not something that's always existed. It was a creation out of this period in history, and it became this really powerful tool for some people like Ben Franklin. Yeah, and of course, I mean, uh, there was also the Masonic element, where right. uh, he was uh, he was a Mason. Um, to what extent it was a um, a firm a firm sort of uh, belief, or whether it was something that he found extremely useful. I mean, for instance, he was a very sort of um, important Mason in Philadelphia. Uh, when he came to um, when he came to to London after 1757, he was less active. You you can't find many examples of him at uh, Masonic meetings. But I mean, he did go to the Grand Lodge of England, which was a sort of the you know, the major lodge. And it is quite likely that he met the Duke of Newcastle there, who was in the late 1750s. He was Prime Minister. And in a sense, that was actually the incredible importance of the Masons, because it allowed people from all parts of society, not just aristocrats, but non-aristocrats to meet together and rub together, as you say, and exchange ideas. And uh, that was actually pretty important. That's great. Uh, let's, uh, we have another question I'm, I'm curious to hear you, uh, your thoughts on. Uh, Niels is, is interested in another sort of role that Franklin might have played in introducing ideas to the United States. Uh, he says that Franklin would, would have been exposed to major industrial enterprises in England. I don't know anything about the Lunar Society. Perhaps you could talk about that. But did he play a role in building American industry using what he learned in England? What can you well, tell in us? Sense, well, in a sense, he did. Um, on, his first, on his first trip, uh, because after all, um, it, after his second trip, when he went back in 1775, I mean, that was when he was a politician and he was effectively retired. But certainly when he, uh, when he went back to um, America and he became a, um, a highly successful printer, but not only was he a printer, successful printer on his own behalf, he set up a whole load of satellite printing shops mm. right down the Atlantic seaboard. And it was the kind of the first great, you know, just with everything, all these other firsts, it was the first great franchise operation that uh, they would uh, all use the same Caslon typeface. So if there was a really big job, 
they could actually shunt it up and down the, the seaboard. And the deal was that Franklin would start these people up. He would, he would actually pay for all the, uh, all the machinery and uh, he would uh, you know, be paid off over a period of 16 years. And then uh, they would actually set up as, as independents. But I mean, he was also at one stage, he was the greatest paper distributor in America because hmm. he would see some, some great, great plan. But when it came to, to Britain, when he was in Britain, he made great friends with, with Richard Arkwright in Birmingham. I mean, he just loved going there and, uh, and seeing all this fantastic machinery in operation. And he would go, uh, he did several tours around, around Britain with, uh, with various scientific chums. And they would go and visit, you know, these industrial centers of Birmingham and Leeds and would see all this uh, machinery in, in operation. So, uh, you know, I think one could say that he had a, um, when he got back, uh, he had an inspiring role, but in terms of anything practical, uh, no, I've, by that stage, by uh, 1775, he was leaving it to others. Very interesting. I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, this has been a great opportunity, by the way, for the Mount Vernon audience. I know we also have a lot of people coming to us uh, from all over, including uh, uh, patrons of the Ben Franklin House. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to talk about other founders and how they interacted with one another and, and some of the ways in which they uh, uh, viewed one another. I, I think we've already touched on a number of these things, particularly Franklin and Washington. Adam's interested in in how uh, he mentions Franklin's relationship and thoughts about Jefferson. I might ask if, if you might uh, expand that to, I don't know, the, uh, the other views of, of one another, Jefferson on Franklin and Washington. What, what's your sense of, of how these, these men read one another, uh, how they related to one another, what they thought about uh, well, there, one another? There was great aberration uh, obviously, for Franklin, for Washington, but also for Jefferson. I mean, after all, they were um, two of two of the five who uh, were involved in the Declaration of Independence. Now, in fact, um, Jefferson didn't actually, um, I, said, I was going to say own up, but that's completely wrong, uh, didn't identify himself as the writer of the Declaration of Independence until much later. But it was so well written, people actually thought it had been written by Benjamin Franklin. Hmm. But Franklin, Franklin actually only added, uh, you know, a tiny bit uh, to the to the Declaration, and uh, basically um, he took out the any sort of um, reference to the Almighty, and he basically said these rights are self evident. The self evident was the important one because it was actually appealing to a form of, of natural law. And I think that was quite important because it meant that the declaration, and you're, you know this far better than me, Kevin, but it meant that the religious element was not such a, was not going to be a divisive factor during the, uh, during the revolution that all these different faiths and non-faiths could actually come together. Well, that's right. It's a very, it's a big country. Uh, it's something uh, Franklin understood that as well as anyone could. Uh, that's always struck me too, that those people that spent time overseas, uh, like Ben Franklin, saw the American colonies and, and, the, and eventually the United States a bit differently uh, than those who had never left. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, he, he must have seen the diversity, but also, of course, from, from a, a far vantage, there's also that, that unity of, of purpose and that, that unity of American identity. Yeah, but I mean, as for Jefferson, I mean, he really admired Franklin. And if uh, hmm. you go to, uh, to Monticello, I mean, in the, uh, in the sort of the main room there, you'll see that uh, portraits on the wall well, he's got Locke. Uh, he's also, he's got Francis Bacon. I think if I remember rightly, he's got Defoe or Addison. I can't quite remember. But most importantly of all, uh, he certainly got Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, but most importantly of all, with all these thinkers, he's got Benjamin Franklin. Yeah. And uh, he actually bought quite a lot of uh, Franklin's scientific instruments. And I think I'm right in, th in thinking that uh, Franklin didn't actually invent bifocals, uh, but he certainly popularized them. And I saw in the, they had an exhibition in the convention uh, center in Philadelphia, which I went to. 
and they had Jefferson had some trifocals. Uh, he wasn't trying to be sort of go one up, but it was going back to what we were saying before. It was taking a great idea and thinking, oh, can we can we advance this a little bit more? Which That's is remarkable. Which, I this is this is this has been a great conversation, George. We've just scratched the surface of a lot of of the themes that we wanted to talk about today, but I I think really fruitfully. Uh, I want to ask you about something. I've got a little George Washington over my shoulder. You do as well, uh, and I've I've, I've been uh, noticing this. This was actually something that we were able to give you just as you were leaving the Washington Library in Mount Vernon. Is that right? It is. It is on that sad sad day that I. I had to leave you after a wonderful, wonderful six months as a fellow. Um, Stephen McLeod placed this in my hand, and it's um, it's a record. It's 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 the uh, Udon bust of George Washington, and it's got a sort of uh, a recognition of my fellowship time underneath. So. Um, well we were thrilled to have you there as a fellow, but more important, we're thrilled to have your continuing relationship uh, with Mount Vernon. We're excited about some of the, the, the projects. You've got two going on right now. Uh, I, we've talked a lot about the one. I wonder if you could just say uh, that that is your, your work on the information war of the revolution. Could you say a brief word about the second? Well, the second is, uh, and I think this is the way that the fellowship is supposed to work at Mount Vernon that I made great friends with another fellow, uh, Chef Justin Cherry, who's a great uh, expert on colonial food. So he's not only a, um, so he brings the, the two together and actually has often been at Mount Vernon uh, with his, um, his, his colonial style, well, it's basically a colonial oven in which he, break, he bakes bread and other nice delicacies. Anyway, we, um, we came up with the idea of uh, doing a, a, a mini biography of George Washington uh, based on uh, his, his uh, relationship with food. So in a sense, um, using the food, because after all, when he was president, he did his tour uh, and he eventually went to every, he had been to every single one of the colonies uh, the original 13 colonies. So it's food from the 13 colonies. And I do the very, very sort of mini biography. And Justin does the delicious food. And everybody at Mount Vernon knows it's delicious because he tried and tested the recipes at Mount Vernon. So it's been a few publishers now, and we're hoping somebody's going to pick it up quite shortly. Well, that's great. We're very excited about that, excited about the work you're doing, uh, excited about this ongoing uh, partnership with the Ben Franklin House. Uh, I've enjoyed the heck out of this conversation. Thank you, George. Uh, and well, I, evening there. So I, I suppose I should say good evening and have a, have a wonderful night. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, Kevin. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm delighted at this ongoing relationship and I'm, I'm very pleased to be a sort of common link between Benjamin Franklin House and Mount Vernon. That's wonderful. Thank you, George. And thank you to all of you for joining us today. It's been a, a great conversation. Hope to see you again very soon. Have a great day.